Hello. We've now reached the final part of Burgers Chapter 5, which I've entitled The Quest for Certainty. The book came out in 1979, and its subtitle is Contemporary Possibilities of Religious Affirmation, with the present chapter being that of the inductive uh, approach. For Berger, the inductive approach is the most secure basis for religious affirmation in the modern world. But as he recognises, it has its frustrations, which he addresses in these final two sections of the chapter. The quest for certainty and its frustrations. There are three persistent problems with the classical liberalism and indeed any version of the inductive model. One, how to distinguish true from false religious experience. Two, what is the status of one's own preferred historical religion? And three, religious certainty. The three are actually all parts of the same problem, but it's easier to deal with them separately. The problem of how to distinguish true from false religious experience. Weren't the false prophets of the Old Testament those who lost? And the winners always write the history of any aspect of life. The Israelite prophets got popular support by their personal magnetism and miracle working, for example, with Elijah against the Baalim on Mount Carmel. Would their prophecy have been valid if they lacked charisma and signs? William James, an explicit inductivist, offered two answers in his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience. First, and consistent with James's pragmatism and empiricism, is the idea that religious truth is known by its fruits, that is, the moral consequences of religious experience. But, contrary to James, many religious virtuosi don't seem to have been very nice people. Does that make their experience less valid? Contrarywise, Einstein's niceness doesn't increase the truth of his theory, and if he had been nasty, that wouldn't have disproved it. Secondly, the cognitive results of religious experience are important. James recognises that mystical insights may be very close to insanity, so they're not infallible. But the non-mystics can sift and test those insights by using their reason, as Ghazali recommended. This is an empirical test. This is not enlightenment rationalism. James and Otto saw reason as an inadequate means of describing religious experience. Religious experience is beyond rationality. But at the same time, rationality does provide us with a means of distinguishing truth from falsity. The second problem is the status of one's preferred historical religion. Given the heretical imperative, why choose one heresy over another? Ernst Trolch, the historian and sociologist, was much concerned with this. In his The Absoluteness of Christianity, he fully accepted that relativity extended to religion, but he was also a Christian theologian, so what to do? Methodologically, Christianity's absolute truth claims could not be established scientifically, nor was it possible to place Christianity at the top of some quasi-Hegelian evolutionary ladder. Christianity was a historical phenomenon, like any other. His response was as follows. It was possible to reduce religion to major types. There were a multiplicity of primitive forms and two opposing types of great religions in Western Asia and India. The historian could establish the choices, but only the philosopher or theologian could choose on the basis of some normative measure based on religious ideas as a subjective but informed decision. Trolch's approach assumed that all great religions had something in common, which had general validity, the rev revelation of a higher life. Whilst all religions tended towards the absolute, the absolute was never empirically available or a safe possession. Rather, it was an intuition or an intimation. On this basis, each religion had its own unique and uniquely valid relation to the absolute, though some were closer to it than others. We need, therefore, to search for the essence of Christianity, as per Schleimacher. The third problem of inductivism is religious certainty. 
This was a major cause for the neo-orthodox revolt against liberalism. Bart and others confronted this as preachers. How can you preach something if you aren't certain about it? All religious representatives have this problem, but it's also true for the layman or laywoman who doesn't have the theological tools to cope with such questions or to establish the truths of his or her tradition. In phenomenological terms, we can never gain absolute certainty in this world. Even the virtuosi returns to everyday life, such that the religious experience is only a memory. How can we maintain the sense of the extraordinary within the realities of the ordinary? And remember, most people don't even have such experiences. Note, even Teresa of Avila, the Christian mystic, was confused by what she took to be the devilish voices which she sometimes heard in her religious experiences. Those who have tasted the relativizing fruits of modern reflectiveness can't follow the practical solution of the intellectually naive blind, taken for granted acceptance of their tradition. Schultz's response was piety required truth, but not absoluteness. The individual could feel certain on the basis of his or her own experience, even in the face of historical and sociological awareness. But access to truth was never absolute or final. There was no room for fanaticism. There was no need to see every challenge to exclusive absolutism as a threat to belief. Mellow certainty was better. This leads to what Berger refers to as the defence of mellowness. Berger regards his account of the three paths of religious affirmation in the modern world as having been fair but not neutral. Ultimately, for him, the inductive option is the only viable one. The classical liberal Protestant model is applicable to all religions, though without its sense of Protestant superiority, of course. Against the deductivism of the neo-Orthodox, this is a reassertion of human experience as the only valid starting point for theological reflection and a rejection of any external authority, whether it be scriptural, ecclesiastical or traditional, that would impose itself on such reflection. Against those who would compromise with secularity, it reasserts the sacredness of the religious experience and of the supernatural and rejects the oppressive authority of modern secular consciousness. This option has its own plausibility structure, as do the others. It's easier to be mellow when life seems relatively normal in the midst of crisis. And it's unsurprising that fanaticism flourishes when society is in crisis, as per Germany in the 1918-45 to period. But that doesn't alter its epistemological status. Those in marginal situations, whether societal, war, oppression or individual, such as personal sorrow, illness, the proximity of death, are more likely to opt for fanaticisms of either the neo-orthodox or secularized revolutionary type. But these may obscure the insights of normal life. Just because there are no atheists in foxholes doesn't prove the existence of God. Both normal and marginal situations provide insights which are valid. Berger doesn't want to either privilege or dismiss as pathological the insights from marginal situations. Mellowness can come out of greater inner strength regardless of the situation. So that's all for this chapter. Uh, thank you very much for listening and particular thanks to my patrons for their support and encouragement. If you want to support my channel, you're very welcome to do so. Like, comment and share. Uh, on the video. Subscribe if you want to be notified of future videos and I'll provide Patreon and PayPal links below if you want to provide practical support. Next week we move on to the final chapter in Berger's book Between Jerusalem and Benares. Uh, have a good day.